Okay, I'm recording now. Um, let me see if I can still stream. Okay, now I'm streaming. And let me just see if the recording is still going. It looks like it's still going. Okay, so I have no idea what the issue was, but it appears to be fine now. Um, hopefully this won't crash. Um, anyway, I'll get into it. So, okay, so we're talking about audio. Um, let's start this slideshow. Um, and so I might use Audacity at various points to um, demonstrate different things, uh, but um, most of what I'll talk about, we'll just look at on here. Um, as I mentioned before, feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions, and hopefully my computer is not gonna crash while we're looking at this. Okay, so, um, when we, so just to kind of give a very like simplistic brief explanation of how sound works um, is essentially sound is a wave in a medium that's generated by an object vibrating um, or displacing uh, part of that medium. So most of the time when we hear sound, the medium we're talking about is air. Um, and that can be kind of confusing because we tend to think of air as, you know, basically nothing, but air actually has um, you know, particles and it has mass, it has weight. Um, it's just that it's very small. The weight and the, the mass of those particles is very small. So it's very easy. It's very, it's very easy for us to move through air, uh, unlike, you know, solids or liquids. Um, but there still is uh, a mass. There's still, you know, something of, there's still particles and things that air is made up of. And so when you make a sound, when you clap, the, what's happening is that you're displacing that air that was kind of in between your hands. And then when you clap, you're displacing the air. And so that displace, that creates a wave of displacement that reverberates through that medium. So it could be through a solid, you know, if you're playing like a really loud bass, um, it will reverberate through even, you know, very solid objects like walls or, um, or uh, you know, uh, the ground. Um, if you are underwater, you can still hear things, but they're a little bit more muffled because the water as a medium has uh, more mass. And so this, the waves that are generated by sounds don't travel as far. In the air, there's very little resistance. So that's where sound can really travel very far is air. So if you've ever dropped like a rock or um, a pebble into water and you see the waves of water that it generates, that's basically what's happening when you create a sound. When I'm talking, my vocal cords are displacing air, and that's generating waves that you know go outward. Um, and that's what is getting picked up by the microphone. That's what the mi microphones are created to sense, is that change in air pressure. Um, and that's what we hear when we're talking to each other or uh, listening to music or other things that create waves. You can also imagine if, if you guys have ever played an instrument like the guitar, when you pluck a guitar string, it moves up and down. And so you can actually really see the physical embodiment of that displacement uh, of air that's being created um, by that uh, sound. So that's a really, really simplistic overview of what sound is. And it's a little bit helpful to understand that because we can look at how sound is represented uh, in our digital uh, sound editing software. Um, so most of the time when we are looking at sound, and we looked at this on Tuesday with Audacity, we're looking at a waveform. And a waveform is just a graphic re representation of the loudness of sound over time. And so the loudness is changes in pressure. If I clap really loudly, I'm displacing a lot of air. If I clap very quietly, I'm displacing much less air. So those changes in pressure map to the loudness of the sound. So we see the loudness of the sound represented with the vertical axis, and then we see time represented in the horizontal axis. So we can kind of see, you know, the imprint of a voice or uh, an instrument or background sounds over time. And that helps us to edit uh, our sounds um, because we can kind of like see where things get loud. We can, we basically have like a visual representation of what the sound looks like that helps us know where to cut and what to listen to. But it doesn't tell us everything about the sound. We still have to listen to it to understand, you know, which part of the sound that we're. Um, so a waveform represents loudness or 
the amount of change in pressure over time. Um, each sound wave has a couple of different properties. Uh, the wavelength is basically how uh, long one of the waves is. So a lower sound will have a longer wavelength and a higher sound will have a higher wavelength. The amplitude is how loud the sound is or you know, how large it goes, um, basically how much uh, medium is, is uh, displaced to create that wave. And then the frequency is the number of waves inside of like a particular um, area. So something with a high frequency will have a lot of waves and something with a low frequency will have a low number. Um, so we can see a, a sound wave right here. Um, and actually, I think after this, yeah, we'll move over to, we'll go through this and then I'll go to Audacity and kind of demonstrate. So here we see, the, see uh, a sound wave. Um, and we can see the wavelength. That's the uh, length of one wave. So when we display something, basically a wave is the displacement kind of like going in and out. So as we displace the air, air around it is going to expand because uh, we're displacing air into those areas. So we get the, the uh, beginning of the wave. And then when that leaves, we get the other side of the wave. So that's why the wavelength goes equally up as down. Um, it doesn't have to, but generally that's what it does. Um, and then the amplitude is just the distance from the middle of our wavelength, either up or down. Uh, so, um, yeah, the distance between the highest and lowest point. Um, and the higher it is, obviously, the louder the volume is. And we measure amplitude in something called decibels, which is kind of a hard thing to understand, uh, but we'll look at the decibel scale. Um, so then frequency is how many waves there are per basically cycle of sound. Um, and we measure that in hertz. We were looking at, at this a little bit the other day when we were looking at audacity, the sort of uh, spectrogram, those different ranges. Um, and we can see in a second, I'll do a little demo of this, that what we can hear is about 20 hertz. So that means 20 waves per second, up to 20,000 hertz, 20,000 waves. Second. So anything in within that range, we as human beings can physically hear. Um, you know, it kind of depends. I've uh, was you know played a lot of music in my life, so I've kind of damaged my ears a little bit. So my high end for what I can hear is a little bit lower than twenty thousand hertz. Um, some people have a little bit higher. It just kind of depends a little bit on how your ears work. Um, and you know, as you know, you can you probably heard of like dog whistles and things like that that are much louder than twenty thousand hertz. So people can't hear them, but dogs can hear them, other animals can hear them. So this has to do a little bit with the, your, you know, sort of physical biology. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, this and then we'll look at audacity for just a second. So frequency and pitch are related. Basically, the higher a frequency is, the higher the pitch of the sound, and the lower the frequency is, the lower the pitch of the sound. Um, when we're creating music, we're making very specific pitches that have like a, a harmonic relationship to each other. Um, and that's kind of based on different standards. Like you have the Western standard of um, even temperament, which is how you get like, you know, the 12 tones and the melodic uh, scales and stuff like that. Other, uh, other cultures have different um, relationships where they might have more or fewer uh, tones within their sort of uh, musical scales. Um, we're not going to go a lot into music, but that's just for reference. You know, you, if you've played music before, you've probably understood that relationship between frequency and pitch. Um, OK, so I'm going to switch streams for just a second to demonstrate a couple of those concepts in uh, Audacity. Um, so going to stream audacity for a second and i have my project open um, but i'm going to create something new so i'm just going to make these guys small and um i'm going to mute them so we can just ignore those recordings for a second and so in audacity we can actually generate tones and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to generate a sine wave just to show you guys what this really looks like. So if I generate a sine wave, wait, I click stop on that. Uh, I'm gonna go to generate and go to tone. And 
And so I have some options here. I'm going to choose a sine wave. And then 440 is the frequency of um, the A uh, note, um, the middle A note in uh, Western even temperament. Um, and I'm going to generate it just for one second. I don't need 30 seconds. So I'm going to click Generate. Oh, and it did it in that other track. I don't want to do that. So let's make a new track. So I'm just going to make a mono track here and try that again. I'm going to generate a sine wave. So when we're zoomed out, this just looks like a bunch of crazy sound. But when I zoom in really close, you can start to actually see the waveform that we were just talking about. Um, and so when I create a sine wave, a sine wave is basically just like a very even up and down wave. And I'll play that for a second. It sounds a little annoying, but uh, you guys will be able to hear it. So if that sounds familiar, it's because they use that. You may have heard something that sounds like that in testing uh, for TV podcasts. And a lot of animations start with a little tone like that to, to kind of like um, oh, somebody asked if I'm recording. I am recording this. Uh, yes. So yeah, this part is being recorded. Um, so, so we can see that actual waveform when we zoom in. Uh, and then we can also go to the spectrogram view. And we can see the frequencies. So if we zoom in a little bit here, you can see that the loudest frequencies are right around that 400 or 440 where we generated it. So this yellow part is that 440. And then because it's a sine wave, it has very even pressure. So that's why we get this really even looking gradient uh, in the other frequency ranges. OK, so that's pretty exciting. Um, so let's uh, increase this just a little bit. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to, I'm going to go to multi-view for a second, um, and how do I get, there we go, okay, so we're back in multi-view for just a second, I'm going to delete this, and I'm going to generate something else, I'm going to go to generate, and I'm going to click um, tone, and so we have other options. So I can do something like a sawtooth wave. And you're going to see this has a different uh, quality. So when I zoom in on here, what this does is instead of having smooth up and down uh, waves, it goes straight up in a uh, 45 degree angle, and then it goes straight down. And so that creates a really uh, interesting uh, tone because we're kind of like cutting out all these frequencies. And you're probably going to recognize this a little bit if you've ever listened to uh, 80s uh, synth music. OK, so that has this kind of like jagged, edgy tone to it. And a lot of electronic music uses different types of waves to create different sort of effects. So it might sound a little bit more. Um, so one more thing that I want to make while I'm here, I'm going to go to generate. And this time I'm just going to do noise. Uh, and I'm going to generate some pink noise, and I'm just going to do one second and click Generate. And so now, look at this pink noise. It's all over the place. Because it doesn't have an even waveform, it's going to sound, we're going to hear frequencies all over the place. And you can see in the spectrogram, there's you know yellows and oranges all over the place. And this is just going to sound like noise. So when we have all of these different frequencies everywhere, we don't hear a tone because there's no, there's no collection around a specific frequency. Um, and so that sounds to us. Um, so let's go back to our sine wave for just a second. So one thing I want you to notice, so I'm going to go to generate, I'm going to do a tone, and I'm going to do a new sine wave and generate our first sine that we had. And then I'm going to go over here and click Generate again. And this time, I'm going to do a different tone. I'm going to do A. And so since I doubled the frequency, what I'm going to get is A, but at the next octave. And so we can listen to that. So we can hear, to us, it sounds like the same tone, but at a new octave. They sound similar. They have a similar uh, relationship mathematically, um, but the with the higher frequency, uh, we hear a higher tone. 
And so if I zoom in uh, with these guys next to each other, you can kind of see our 440 is a little bit wider and our 880 is a little bit smaller. So that change in the distance of our waves is what makes that uh, change in frequency that we perceive as different tones. Um, so let's do one more that's lower. So I'll go here and go to generate tone. And this time I'm going to do 220. Okay, so this is half. Uh, and so if we zoom in here, you're going to see it's even wider than our 40. Uh, and it's going to sound lower. And that's kind of the basis for, you know, how we can synthesize music and synthesize sound. Um, you can see with my other recordings. So if I open up my voice recording. And let's go over to the spectrogram. So notice that there are these uh, kind of like bright areas around certain certain frequencies, but there there's a bunch of them. So we when I speak, it's not if I sing, if I try to hit specific notes, which I'm not I'm going to spare you guys that but I could sing and try to hit like a good A or, you know, uh, middle C or something like that. And I'd probably be able to get pretty close, but there'd still be some noise around it because I'm not going to be able to sing a perfect note uh, the way that the computer can generate a perfect note. But when I'm just talking, you can see there's a wide collection of different frequencies. Most of my voice is a little bit lower. So a lot of my, uh, the, the sort of hotter areas are actually below this 440 down to like 100 uh, level. And then 1000 is kind of like where a lot of human voices are. Um, if you have just kind of like a middle uh, frequency voice, it's going to be around 1,000. If you have a little bit of a higher voice, it might be around 1,200 um, or 12,000. Uh, and then as we go up in the scale, obviously, you know, most people don't uh, have a voice that goes up to 20,000. So some animals. Um, I'm not going to play the 20,000 hertz tone because uh, it's just going to hurt your ears. Or a lot of you probably won't even be able to hear it, but some of you will hurt your ears, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, but hopefully that makes it a little bit more clear, uh, the, the relationship between the frequency um, and the, uh, the sound of, of a piece of audio. Um, so let's turn this back to wait. And let's go back to our for a bit. So I'm going to switch the stream again. Okay. Okay. So when we're digitizing sound, similar to what we did with images, where we take the original image and then we take out the little pixels and look at the colors, and then we can kind of decide which colors to keep or which colors we don't need, we do a similar thing with sound, which is called sampling and quantizing. So Sampling is basically when we record a sound, we can't, we can't, sound has like an infinite wave. So there's an infinite amount of data. And we can't record that with our computers because our computer is a digital medium. Old mediums like records and tapes actually did record sound in an infinite wave uh, because they're using analog media and they can record all of the values in the sound. Um, but with digital media, we can't really do that because we're using computer chips and computer chips can only store numbers uh, that are either zero or one. So we basically have to figure out a way to recreate a sound wave using what's called samples, where we sample the value of the sound, which is a combination of the amplitude and the frequency at any given uh, you know, moment. And so we try to sample the sound as many times as we can to recreate the curve digitally. So you see on the left here, this is a, a representation of a smooth, uh, regular curve. And then on the right is what our computer is actually doing. It's taking, it's going at all these little bits and saying, what's the value here? What's the value here? And if we do that enough times, most people can't tell the difference when we play it back. They can't tell the difference between uh, the original sound and the recording of the sound. But if we desample, if we downsample or only sample a few places, then you start to hear uh, where we're missing frequencies or we're missing parts of the sound. And that's sort of like our JPEG compression that we look at with Photoshop, where eventually if we take out enough of the color data, we start to be able to see the differences. 
Um, and so when we're recording and when we're creating files on the computer with sound, we're trying to kind of like get a compromise between enough samples that it sounds good and sounds like the original sound, but not so much that it takes up our entire hard drive. So just like we saw with images, there's a little bit of a trade-off with sounds when we're recording between the quality um, and the file size. So typically, uh, most sound that you're going to listen to on the internet is recorded at 441 uh, or 44,100 hertz, and that's per second. So that means for a sound, you've made 44,100 samples in one second. So that's a lot. That's a ton of information. Uh, that's not the default. For a little bit higher quality, you might go with 48K. Uh, um, for movies, you would do like 96K, so you really get very good quality sound. Um, for podcasts, if you're recording a podcast, you probably want like 48K so that you really get a lot of the range of frequencies that you get in a voice, so it sounds normal and not like, you know, kind of digitized. Um, but we can see some examples of that in just a second. So that's sampling. The other aspect of recording sounds is quantizing, which is basically how much information do we save in each one of these samples. So first we're sampling this, just like making slices uh, over the course of a sound and saving those slices. And then quantizing is how much information do we allocate to each slice. So if it's just one bit, it's zero or one, it's basically just either it's gonna be loud or it's not gonna be loud. That's not enough to reproduce the sound very well. If we go to two bits, we might be able to hear a little bit better. Um, but most of the time, we're going with at least 16 bits. Because we can see with one bit, we only have two possible values. That's not enough to recreate a sound well. Two bits, you have four possible values. You could start to get the outlines of a sound, but it's not going to be very good. When we get up to 16 bits, now we have 65,000 possible values. Now we're talking. Now we can really save a lot more data. Um, and then with most sounds these days, you're either going to have 16-bit, you might have 24-bit or 32-bit. Um, you've probably heard of 8-bit music. 8-bit music is from early video games where they didn't have a lot of data that they could store on a video cartridge. So one of the ways they save space is by recording music in 8-bit. And that's how you get that kind of crunchy, distorted sound because there's not as much detail available in the recording. And so we'll look at an example of that. Um, so for our projects, we'll probably go with 44.1. If you want to do something a little bit higher quality, you can do 48K. And then for the bit depth, the default in Audacity is 32-bit. You can get away with 16 or 24, but 32-bit is um, So uh, for recording audio, um, we're just going to use our phones for this. So we don't really have to talk too much about um, these fancy recorders. If you happen to have access to like a Tascam recorder or a Zoom recorder, feel free to use those. You'll get much higher quality sounds. Um, but for us, using the microphone in your in your iPhone or your Android phone um, or just your computer is going to be plenty. Um, and okay, I think this is. Oh no, we're gonna. Okay, yeah. So I want to show sampling and quantizing um, for just a second. So I'm gonna go and go back to Audacity. Uh, I'm going to switch streams again. Go to Audacity. Um, all right. So actually, I'm going to make a new file for this just to keep things. OK. So I'm going to make a new track. So I'm going to go to Tracks. Add a mono track. Um, and I'm trying to decide if I should record my voice. Yeah, I'll just record my voice. So uh, I'm recording my voice and I'm going to show what it sounds like when I down sample. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. I'm just going to edit, trim this a little bit. So we just have some audio data to work with. Okay. You can see I recorded this at 44.1 hertz in a 32-bit float, and this is what it sounds like. Uh, I'm recording my voice, and I'm going to show what it sounds like when I downsample. Okay, so let's get rid of my um at the beginning. Recording my voice, and of oh, course I went a little too far. I'm going to hit Control Z. I'm recording. I'm recording. Okay, so let's take out this. 
I'm recording my voice. Okay. I'm going to normalize this. So I'm going to go to effect and go to normalize, volume and compression, normalize, apply, make it a little bit louder. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to downsample this. So if I click on the track settings and I go down to format and rate, I can actually change both of these values within the room. So I can go to rate. If I downsample this to like 8,000 hertz, it's going to slow it way down. But you're also going to hear these like digital artifacts. Um, so let me also, now that I've done that, I'm going to use an effect to speed it up. So let's change the. Uh, I'll do pitch. It doesn't let us see what you're doing, like what you're looking at. It just shows the audio thing. So we can't see the uh, options. Yeah. yeah. Okay, because I'm just streaming the window, but if I stream my whole computer, then the sound won't work. Um, well, it'll be in the video recording. Um, so I'll try to, I'll just try to describe what I'm looking at when I open up those dialogue windows. Um, but then it'll be on uh, the video recording, uh, will have everything in it because I'm recording my whole screen. Um, so sorry about that. That's a little bit of a limitation of using the, um, discord, but I'll try to, I'll just try to describe what I'm looking at when I do these effects. Um, so, uh, so when I click this drop down, you don't see it. No, we don't see any. Okay. Um, so I'm going to undo that. And then do it again. So I'm going to increase the volume here. So now what I'm doing, I'm just double clicking to select all the audio and then I'm going to effect. And here there's an option for called volume and compression, which goes to another list under which is normalize. And then normalize, uh, I'm just setting to negative six. There's, a, there's only really one parameter. And then I click the apply button. And that, you can see it increases it. It just increases the volume. But then when I click on this drop down here where it says audio one, um, there's a bunch of different uh, things here. One of them is format. And it has a list with 16-bit, 24-bit, and 32-bit. And then there's a rate format with starting at 8,000 and going up to uh, 384,000. And basically what I'm doing is I'm just setting the rate really low and you can hear the result is that the audio is stretched out. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pitch it up to hopefully close to what it was before. So I'm going to effect and there's a list of pitch and tempo and I'm changing, I'm just clicking change pitch and that gives me some options. Um, and I'm just going to uh, use the percent change slider and I'm going to speed it up uh, like 400%. So let's listen to that. I'm recording my... Okay, so it's not quite up to the original speed, so I'm going to try another 200%. Okay, so that's good enough to show the basic point which I'm trying to do is when I downsampled my voice, I lost all of this information. I lost all these different frequencies to the extent that when I play it back, it's totally uh, incomprehensible. So that's why we need a, you know, a high enough sample rate to get enough data um, to be able to hear it well. Um, so I'm going to undo this a couple times. And go back to the original. Uh, I'm recording my. Okay, so then another thing I can do in these options, there's also an option for format, but it only lets me go down to 16 bit. You guys won't be able to hear the difference there. Um, but if I select my audio and I go to effect and I go to distortion and modulation, I think I can do some distortion here. Um, oh, it doesn't have. What I want to do is. Oh, it doesn't have what I want, which is a bit. Uh, let me see if I can find another one.
Uh, maybe it doesn't. They, I think, this used to be a default thing, but I don't see it here. Okay, so we'll skip that um, for now. But usually when you do distortion, if you guys know what distortion is, like when you hear a guitar, but it sounds kind of like uh, muddy and, and edgy, uh, basically that's taking the number of bits in the recording and reducing it really low. So you lose a lot of the data. And that's how you get that sort of, remember that sawtooth wave that we saw a little bit while ago. That's how you get that kind of um, sound. Um, okay, so let's go back to the slides for a second. And we just have a couple more to go through. Computer is starting to lose it. Um, okay, so here are just some links to various different types of uh, software. Audacity is obviously the one that we're using, but there are other things like Pro Tools. This is really the industry standard for mixing audio for film and music. Um, Acid Pro is a sequencer, so you can make beats and music with that. Logic is kind of like a more high level sequencer. Uh, that's what a lot of uh, more sort of like electronic producers will use. Um, GarageBand is obviously just a Mac application that is kind of similar to Logic, um, but is a little bit reduced and it's free. It comes with the Mac and you can record music and you can do a lot with uh, GarageBand. Um, and then Adobe Audition is kind of like the Adobe version of Audacity or Pro Tools, where it has a lot more uh, features than Audacity, but it kind of works basically the same way. Um, so a couple of things, we'll go over this a little bit more detail next week, export our files. But this will be a little bit similar to when we looked at JPEGs versus PNGs versus PNGs versus AI files. Uh, with, excuse me, with sound, we have the same thing where we have files like our AUP file, uh, which contains all the edits that we are using when we create uh, an edit in Audacity. But then when we export a file to, for playback, either just to listen to as a podcast or a music file, or to add to a video um, or something like that, we have a few different types of uh, sound files that store the information in different ways digitally. And it's very similar to JPEG and PNG. There's a lot of sort of similar uh, quality. So the WAV format is an old format that is uncompressed, meaning it has, uh, you know, all of the data. It doesn't try to get rid of any of the data uh, in order to save file size. So it's typically a larger file size um, and it's a higher quality audio. Um, that was an early version. Apple has their own version called AIFF. Um, which is standard for, you know, if, when you when we used to have iTunes and we listened to music on iTunes and downloaded files, if we wanted a nice file, we would download an AIF F file. Um, PCM is similar to the WAV file. Um, it's used more for like uh, film and CDs and stuff like that. Uh, MP3 is the big one uh, that is the most sort of common now. It's very, very, very compressed, but it has a good compression algorithm. So what that means is it kind of looks at the frequencies in a, usually used for music, but it's used for a lot of different things. Um, it looks at the frequencies in a sound file, and it kind of says, like, if it's above this certain range and there's not that much of it, you probably can't really tell the difference if we just take it out. And so it gets rid of all the frequencies it doesn't think that you're going to hear, and then uh, that's how it saves the file size. So MP3 really changed things a lot. Um, you guys probably are too young to remember Napster. Uh, but I was like the exact right age for Napster when it first came out and you could suddenly download all of the music that you'd ever heard of uh, illegally for free online. And the MP3 format was really important for that because if these had been WAV files, it would have taken, uh, you know, hours and hours or days to actually download the music. But because we had MP3s, uh, it became very, very popular. And it was, still took a long time to download a song, uh, but much less time than otherwise. So MP3 is still kind of the standard for a lot of different, um, uh, especially for music. You can get a MP3 of any song that's like three to four minutes long. That's probably about one or two megabytes. So it, it's not going to take up that much space on your computer. 
Anyway, some of you guys might remember this. Some of you guys might not. You know, back, uh, I guess, like 20 years ago when the iPod came out, you had to really carefully allocate the data on your iPod to different albums so that you could, you know, uh, carry the albums that you wanted to around. Um, anyway, that's the MP3. We'll export those next week. AAC is an Apple uh, standard uh, that's sort of similar to the MP3. Um, and that's more typical these days, like YouTube and different places will be looking for AAC uh, in codecs rather than um, MP3. And then Og Vorbis is a, is a newer uh, uh, sound format that is very compressed, but it does a much better job than MP3. MP3 is kind of like old at this point. Og Vorbis has not gained as much traction as MP3 did, um, but it is actually much better at compression. The quality, it keeps more of the quality of the audio, um, but actually has lower file sizes. So if you're making something on your own, using Og Vorbis is a good idea, but distributing it is not as good of an idea because a lot of devices don't support Og Vorbis. So there's kind of like different considerations with all these file formats. And we'll go into a little bit more detail with some of them uh, when we work on exporting next week. Um, so recording and editing, uh, you know, some things to just keep in mind. Um, we always need to test stuff. Uh, you know, there's pro I'm sure you guys have seen movies or TV shows where somebody's making a movie and they forget to hit the record button. Uh, we always want to make sure we understand our gear and how it works before we try it. Um, for most of us, that's just going to be our phones. Uh, but it's important to even just test that your phone recording works before you go somewhere to record. Um, using headphones is a good thing to kind of monitor the ba basic sound. So if you're going to go record somewhere with your phone, take a test recording, just record a little bit of sound, and then listen to it on headphones so you can see if there's a lot of noise that you didn't, uh, you weren't aware of, or if there's other issues. Um, minimizing noise when recording. This is if you're recording voiceovers mostly. Um, you know, you'll hear people talk about recording in their closet or uh, recording in a bathroom to kind of minimize the amount of noise that you hear around them. Um, and then we can add a lot of layers. That's one of the things we'll do with Audacity is we'll add layers to our sound to kind of add to uh, the quality and richness. Um, so a few links to different uh, resources. Of course, there's Audacity, which we're going to use as well as Audacity tutorials. Uh, freesound.org is a really good website that we'll look at in a minute where you can download sounds created by other people. Um, and then uh, there's also the Internet Archive, which has a lot of sounds. It's a little bit harder to navigate, but they have a lot of stuff on there. Uh, there's Creative Commons, and there's music where you can find background music on various uh, royalty-free music websites. Uh, so we'll look at uh, some examples of those. Um, okay, so that's what I want to do next. I'm actually going to stop this recording and start a new.